it is the week building up to Halloween 2015. At home, in his two-room apartment, in a middle-class neighbourhood in the centre of Trollhattan, Sweden, Anton Lundin Peterson is finalising his deadly plans. He adorns himself in a dark, self-crafted uniform. The attire features a modified World War II helmet, a face mask and a long black coat. He is also armed with a Viking style sword and a Japanese dagger. He looks menacing, similar to that of Darth Vader. At 10.06 a.m. He storms through the side entrance of a school, setting in motion events that would shake a nation to its core. Such attacks have sadly become commonplace in many European countries and the United States, but they are unusual in Sweden. So what was it that drove Peterson to attack. Before we dive in, I want to let you know that I make videos weekly, so if you want to see my next one, please hit the like button and subscribe if you are new. It really helps me out. Thank you. In the months leading up to the tragic incident in 2015, Peterson went a noticeable transformation. He retreated further into himself, often sleeping the day away and taking an unusually long time to reply to messages or calls. His mother's concern reached a point where she drove a considerable distance late at night to ensure he was all right, an action which only angered him. He said he was always too busy to see his mother but she suspected that this was so he would not be lectured about not having a job. On a separate occasion, his neighbours were playing loud music across the road, so Peterson used his air rifle to shoot at their window. He smashed one of the panes of glass and effectively silenced the neighbours into fear. His mood became increasingly erratic with even the slightest inconvenience, causing him to become irrationally angry. The subject of his loneliness became a delicate matter that was largely avoided in family discussions. He was losing contact with the world. Peterson has always been this way, a solitary figure despite growing up in a nurturing environment. Raised by caring parents and a supportive older brother, he seemed to vanish into the background once he stepped outside his home. The family resided in a middle-class neighbourhood, living in a townhouse. His mother was employed as an assistant nurse, while his father worked for the Swedish Maritime Administration. From a young age, Peterson displayed peculiar behaviours. He avoided making eye contact and was so sensitive to it that he started wearing sunglasses at all times, even indoors, from the age of just four. His speech development was also behind kids of his age, and though generally mild-mannered, he had a volatile side that emerged when things did not go his way. Growing up, his brother was his only friend. They would play in the woods near their home, and they both shared a strong interest in weapons, especially air rifles. Peterson was tall and had a slender frame, long blonde hair and blue eyes. He was very much Swedish in the classical sense. In school, he kept to himself, avoiding social interactions whenever possible. He wasn't drawn to people, and they, in turn, showed little interest in him. During lunch, he'd choose the most secluded corner of the cafeteria, 
steering clear of group activities and social circles. Not that it mattered much, he was generally overlooked anyway. But Peterson did not see his solitude as a burden. He had come to terms with it over the years. During his late teenage years, Peterson did form friendships with three classmates. Together, they rode mopeds and played video games. However, these friendships fizzled out once they all left school. According to his older brother, these relationships were superficial at best. Peterson still felt like an isolated outsider, even when he was with them. After primary school, Peterson enrolled in Litron, an industrial school in Trollhattan, but he failed to form any new friendships there. During lunch breaks, he would sit alone, distancing himself from his classmates. He was an extremely meticulous individual, prone to being pedantic and often becoming absorbed in the minute details. A fellow student said he was, and quote, quiet, you had to drag words out of him. He said like five words in three years. Never said what he felt or thought. While Peterson was frequently labelled an animal lover, this seemed to stem more from the anxiety about the animal's well-being, rather than simple affection for them. For instance, he refused to go on fishing trips with his family, emphasising with the fish's plight. Also, he couldn't bring himself to feed the family's iguana with locusts. A decision that ultimately led to the iguana's demise. At home, he'd retreat to his room, losing himself for hours in video games like Skyrim, World of Warcraft and Star Wars, The Old Republic. It was in these virtual worlds that Peterson found a semblance of social connection, forging friendships with like-minded individuals from around the world. Peterson had a friendship that crossed from the gaming world onto other social media platforms. His main friend was a young Dutch male of a similar age. They would talk for hours about their lives, about their struggles, and even politics. They became best friends. Struggling with persistent unemployment since completing his secondary school education in 2013, Peterson grew increasingly disheartened. Over a two-year period, he applied to more than 80 jobs, but never received a call for an interview. A stark contrast to his older brother, who secured employment almost immediately, despite having similar educational backgrounds. In the six months leading up to the tragic event, Peterson was living alone in a modest apartment in Trollhattan. He felt isolated, especially after his parents moved to a suburban home outside the city. He blamed his lack of job prospects on the influx of immigrants, primarily from Africa and the Middle East, whom he believed were taking roles that should be reserved for native Swedes. This belief was part of his broader reservations about immigration in Sweden. He identified strongly with the older generation considering them true architects of the nation, and felt that their legacy was being tarnished by these newcomers. The presence of these migrants in Trollhattan seemed so pervasive to Peterson that he felt the Sweden he once knew was becoming unrecognisable. He even expressed to a younger family member that something needed to be done urgently to address what he saw as a pressing issue. In 2015, Sweden faced an unprecedented refugee crisis, with around 163,000 asylum seekers arriving within the span of a single year. The situation reached a critical point in October, the same month as the attack 
public opinion was sharply divided and the refugee issue had become a focal point of national discussion. During this period, incidents of violence against detention centres, mosques and homes for the migrant workers surged to an all-time high, with 36 recorded attacks. This heightened tension and polarisation in Swedish society provided a backdrop for the attack, amplifying existing grievances and anxieties. The record number of asylum seekers intensified national debate and fueled attacks against vulnerable communities. Peterson was in a cycle of depression and despair. In the months building up to the attack, he had no friends, no money, and he was even pushing his family away. But, unexpectedly, a phone call broke through Peterson's cycle. He had applied for a job at a local machinery company, and they had offered him an apprenticeship, with the possibility of full-time employment down the line. This was it. This is what he had been waiting for. For a moment, his face was illuminated by a genuine smile, a rare occurrence in those days. He accepted the offer, and for the next six months, dedicated himself to his new role. Peterson was doing what he found natural, and was meticulously scrutinising every procedure despite his supervisor's advice to focus on efficiency over detail. Ignoring his supervisor's advice would prove to be a mistake, and just a few months into his apprenticeship, Peterson was dismissed from his position. The dismissal sent him spiralling back into a dark mental state. When he returned to the factory to retrieve his personal items, he discovered that his role had already been filled. Although he didn't know his replacement, the colour of the young man's skin was all Peterson needed to see, to draw his own conclusions. He believed the newly hired employee wasn't Swedish. The realisation further solidified his existing grievances and complicated emotional feelings reinforcing his preconceived notions about immigration and employment in Sweden. The combination of perceived injustices and personal struggles with record high immigration served as a catalyst for his devastating actions. It's the morning of the 25th of September, the day of the attack. Peterson has cut his hair to be more militarised. He stares into the mirror as he gets ready in his all black uniform. He leaves a note in the hallway for officers to find. In it, he blames his actions on immigration and on society and declares that he was forced to attack. The blood is on your hands, he writes. He goes on his PC to write a message to his friend in Holland. It reads, Hey man, I don't have a lot of time, so I'll get right down to it. I'm going to be dead in the next hour or two, max. I remember all the fun we had playing SWTOR, and I want you to know that you're the best friend I've ever had. You're awesome. I'm going to miss you so much. Even though I know I could have been more active, but you know me, effing hate myself. If there's an afterlife, I hope to see you there. Those effing cops better aim straight. After bidding his farewells, he left his apartment and drove to the school. The clock showed 10.06 a.m. as he made his way into the school premises through the side entrance. His gaze fell upon Lavin Eskandar, a teacher and David Issa, a student, seated in the back of the cafe. Unfortunately, this was Lavin's day off. Lavin, once a student himself, and now a dedicated teacher at just 20 years old, 
had a true passion for his work and excelled in his role. David Issa was struggling with his work and confided in Lavin. In a heartwarming gesture, Lavin had voluntarily offered to help David even on his day off. A commitment that would tragically collide with the impending chaos. With unfortunate timing, just as Lavin had selflessly extended his help, the impending attack from Peterson was about to unfold. With purposeful footsteps, Peterson marched towards the two males. With chilling precision, the sword sliced diagonally across Lavin's forehead, delivering a fatal wound that sends him tumbling to the floor. The blade strikes twice more as Peterson drives it into Lavin's back, each puncture carrying an intent to kill. One thrust ruthlessly penetrates through the right lung and aorta. Frozen in terror, David's desperate voice pierces the silence, shouting, What the hell are you doing? The sword swung into David's arm and although another fatal wound was intended, it turned out only to be a flesh wound, and David managed to escape. In one corner of the cafeteria, a pair of girls find themselves in a state of shock, their tears flowing in response to the overwhelming situation. Peterson gestures discreetly by raising his fingers to his lips telling them to remain silent, and then proceeds towards the section of the building occupied by classrooms. As he walks by, he encounters a student and a teacher engaged in a hallway discussion. Their existence is spared, simply due to their distinctive blonde hair and striking blue eyes. As he is moving through the corridors, he maintains a relaxed demeanor while actively scouting for fresh targets. By the time the clock hits 10.08 a.m., Principal Zenon had made an urgent call for help to the police. Zenon becomes a frenzied figure racing against danger, unfazed by the risk to his own life. He becomes an alarm dashing through the corridors, determined to alert every student and every staff member. His voice, tinged with panic, commands, Lock yourselves in, a maniac is loose. A ripple of urgency sends colleagues scattering, each tasked with spreading the grim warning throughout the school's grounds. Meanwhile, Peterson, prowls with a calculated malice, his very presence casting an unsettling shadow. Amplified by his mobile phone, an eerie anthem in the form of Dracula by Rob Zombie plays through the air, his predatory hunt now accompanied by a haunting soundtrack. The corridors and library are his hunting grounds, each step methodical, every corner meticulously surveyed. Hidden beneath tables and chairs in the library, a group of young children cling to their yellow excursion jackets, desperate to vanish from his predatory gaze. Interestingly, he avoids targeting the younger students as well as females. Students began to barricade themselves within their classrooms. It felt like an instinctive fight for survival. The cleaning staff found refuge amongst the cleaning supplies in a closet. And on the second floor, a teacher sat by the window, ready to jump out at any sign of the perpetrator. Moving onwards, Peterson moves to the staircase to the second floor. There, he encounters Ahmed Hassan, a pupil who had only recently arrived in Sweden from Somalia. Peterson swiftly stabs him in his abdomen. Hassan's strength wanes as he retreats, descending the stairs in a staggering descent until he finally collapses onto the floor of the cafe area, creating a pool of blood. 
he will later succumb to his wounds in the hospital. The clock now reads 10.12 a.m. Two students approach him. Their curiosity peaked. They have been expecting someone to come to the library to read creepy Halloween tales during the week. And they assumed that this person, dressed all in black, is who they were waiting for. Unaware that the blood staining the sword's tip and his outfit was real, they asked for a photograph. Peterson agrees. The students have the quintessential Swedish look and escape his judgement. He motions with his hand, telling them to come closer. They gather around him, capturing a selfie. The tension, briefly giving way, things seem normal, if only for a few moments. However, this was short-lived, as a vigilant teacher comes over. His name was Professor Nazir Amso. He told them that the school is not a playground and instructed them to return to their classrooms. His focus then turns to Peterson. He questions the attire he's chosen to wear on school premises. Professor Amso steps forward, drawing near enough for Peterson to execute a slashing movement. Panic ensues as the students scatter, the innocence of the moment shattered. Professor Amso has been wounded, but he manages to flee. His terror-stricken urgency, driving him to the building's exterior. En route, he spreads a dire warning to as many students as he can. Amso was bleeding heavily, but he manages to get outside of the school, collapsing on the grass. Concerned individuals rush to his aid, attempting to stop the bleeding. Meanwhile, Peterson is chasing him, driven by a relentless determination. However, he soon realises that he cannot venture beyond the school's boundaries. He retraces his steps, heading back into the corridor on the second floor. As he moves through the corridor, he comes across a classroom and knocks on the door. It opens to reveal Wahed Koza, a 15-year-old student. Peterson's gaze holds an unsettling intensity as he locks eyes with Koza, a tension-filled moment that lingers for around 20 seconds. The fear Koza must have felt in that instance is hard to imagine. Without warning, Peterson suddenly attacks, stabbing Koza in the stomach. Despite his injury, Koza manages to muster the strength to barricade the door with the help of fellow classmates. They work together to keep Peterson outside, using their combined efforts to create a makeshift barrier. Koza's friends rally around him, aiding his attempt to slow the bleeding. At 10.16 a.m., officers arrive at the scene, marking the 10th minute since the attack began. The officers swiftly make their way into the school premises, their presence a glimmer of hope amidst the unfolding chaos. Within the building's confines, they locate the lifeless body of Lavin and the injured Hassan. Peterson heard the wailing sirens outside. He comprehends that the moment of reckoning is upon him and descends to the stairs. As he steps into the corridor, a tense standoff greets him. Two officers brandish their firearms, their voices commanding, police, drop the sword. A few seconds linger. No one knows how this will play out. Then, in an explosive surge, Peterson raises his sword and with a guttural scream ripping from his lips, he lunges towards the officers in front of him. The resounding echoes of two gunshots reverberate through the hallways of the school. Peterson crumples to the floor 
struck by a bullet that pierces his chest. At first, he cries for help, a desperate struggle to cling to life. But as moments slip away, he begins to resist treatment. Instead, he is handcuffed on the floor, staring at the ceiling in silence. When officers take off his mask and ask his name, he answers, Anton Lundin Peterson. Tragically, Lavin Eskander succumbs to his injuries on site at the school. Ahmed Hassan, initially wounded, passes away at the hospital later on the same day. For Nazir Amso, the battle for survival spans six weeks, but his life ultimately slips away within the hospital's walls. Wahed Koza was fortunate in comparison and he survives despite the injuries he sustained. Anton Lundin Peterson succumbs to his wounds as well following the encounter with the police. He too is taken to hospital where he slips away on the same day as the tragic events. Peterson blamed his failures on broader societal issues. In his view, society was misplacing its priorities by focusing on the needs of immigrants, whom he collectively blamed for his own difficulties. His feelings of disappointment, anxiety and anger was channeled against a society that he believed was failing to prioritize people like him. This warped belief system fueled his actions, culminating in a tragic manifestation of hatred and violence that targeted innocent individuals. Thank you for watching. Until next time, stay sane.